Ah, il est passé oh sur la oh super oh artiste Super oh Encore un but sensationnel It's a sad day for handball. The luscious locks of Mikkel Hansen are hanging up their headband and setting off into the sunset after the Olympics this summer. That was the news that came through. We'll be discussing that among many other things that are going on in the handball world. Welcome to the Uninformed Handball Hour. It's myself, Alex Kulesh, and I'm joined by Chris O'Reilly. Chris, how are you doing? Hey, Alex. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, just something that, that sprung to my mind there, as you said, uh, the news coming through. It uh, reminded me of like uh, when a royal uh, member of the royal family dies in the UK and it's like the news anchor. That, that was you now. Is this how big this this is? What a, a royal person dying for the Brits, Miguel Hansen retiring is for the handball world. I, th- I think Miguel Hansen is absolutely a ha- handball royalty. He mm-hmm. is. Oh yes, very good. The face of um, the generation that that we're in, you know, living in Denmark as well for for many years, he kind of transcended the sport in in the country at least in in and broadly across the world. I think a lot of people are able to look at Mikkel Hansen and say, oh yeah, that, that guy is, plays handball or something. Which you can't mm-hmm. say for many handball players in, in this world, you know, then if you pluck someone from the street, it's like Mikkel Hansen is probably the most likely player that they'll recognize. And maybe it's due to his looks, but it looks being his his hair and his persona and his boring character which we might get into a bit as well <laughs> but um you, you can't you can't deny that he's the top of the sport here i am in, in montpellier and so my google search is a little bit skewed towards france but putting Mikkel hansen and going into news and seeing that he's got headlines in the keep in le parisienne on the olympics website you know, so it, it is a, a great example of, of someone who uh, has transcended the sport. The fact that his retirement notice has has hit all of these news agencies. And yeah, it's it's big news. It, it hasn't come as any surprise, though, I think. It was announced uh, on Wednesday afternoon. Already on Tuesday, uh, there were a fair, bit of, a fair few tweets going out about it. TV2, uh, nothing gets past TV2. In Danish handball uh, these days, and, and they were they were ahead of the the news, and uh, yeah, I think it's I, I don't know where where should we start with this because it feels like there's a lot to to unpack here. There's definitely a lot, but you mentioned you checked out the news, so I I, I just did the same on my phone to see what news stories pop up about Mikkel Hansen, and this story from I think it's a Russian or a Belarusian newspaper online. She really took me. The title is Good News. Mikkel Hansen beat depression. Free pass. <laughs> that was the news story <laughs> after the break he took uh, and came back from it. <laughs> Good news. Good news. <laughs> so I, I, with, the, with that news, I, I posted on our social media to kind of gauge the, the standing of Mikkel Hansen in, in the world. So I, I put out, you know, top what player in the world and to, to my surprise he, it ranged to top 10 um, and that is probably surprising for me that you know he's as low as top 10 top 15 in some answers uh, there's a lot of course that you know really top three top five was probably the most common answer but I feel that's underselling Mikkel Hansen's uh, legacy. I don't know what it is. For a player who, you know, he's had one of the best international tournament careers, I think. Um, He has four world championships, um, one European championship and an Olympic gold. 
and there's if you 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 have to exclude the the French players from this, but um, I think he's he's right at the top. If you exclude France, he's right at the top. You know, he's with the kind of Bengen boys as in terms of honors, and especially that run that you know he's still currently on. I would say uh, twenty nineteen World Championship, twenty one World Championship, twenty Olympics, um, uh, twenty sixteen Olympics. Sorry. 2019 World Championship, 21 World Championship, and then another World Championship in 2023, which has come at like a really late stage in his career. Um, it's it's quite quite a strange career trajectory for a player who was touted so highly. It was really the latter stages of his career where he reached his peaks at international level. I think with you know the the top ten stuff. I mean, it very much comes down to people's personal preferences. And there, there are so many great players that, like, could... That some people would say, and hard to argue with, like, no, these people are number one, two, three, four. And still not get to Mikkel Hansen. But I think that's where maybe, like, top five is probably the fairest thing. And then once you're into the top five, we, we had our, our greatest team of all time discussion, remember, which was, uh, which was great fun. But it, 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 it all, and he was very much in the conversation there. So uh, in that sense, very much top 10. I guess for some people, it was the defending that uh, we talked about the defend. Probably the last time we talked about Mikkel Hansen was about his terrible defending in the, in the Euro final. But when it comes to, to uh, his international success, and you mentioned there about, about France and uh, how French players kind of are in a different league. Just look at the rise of the Danish men's national handball team. And before, basically, before twenty, before 2008, when they won that first Euro gold, there was very little to shout about for this team. They had won bronze in 2007, and uh, the only other medal that was a, a silver or gold was in 1967. So they, they got a couple of bronzes, but finally broke through in 2008. And since then, it has been, you know, the the Mikkel Hansen team. And it hasn't just been him. Of course, it's Nicholas Landin. There's been all the, the legends that have come and gone. But two players have been part of that team, basically, throughout the generation, Hansen and Landin. And so that really does say a lot about how they brought this team to to a whole new level. There's one thing that you know people pick on defending, and I I see this actually across a lot of sports. Um, basketball is one that uh, it always comes around. So there's the you know the offensive side, there's the scoring, there's the defending, but a lot of time the playmaking is something that doesn't really get a mention as a overall additional skill it, it kind of falls into attack um but i think michael hansen w- the way he developed as a player really the playmaking is what um set him apart the way he could just stand there and make every defender on the opposing side terrified just because michael hansen has the ball his wrist his shot is unique it um like it, it's. I think it's. He's influenced the sport with his style. His, you know, we see it with someone like uh, Skip Agotu, Um That uh, there's this kind of okay, get the ball, survey the area, and have so many weapons at hand. Whether it's a shot, it's a pass, or um, into the line, into the wing, just a quick pass. All of that is under full control with Michael Hansen to an extent where actually when Denmark played with a player up, they just scored every single time. Like every single time, just because he had some of the best decision making and precision passing that we've ever seen. Um and, you know, maybe that kind of standing style is not completely new. Ivano Balic is always someone who got brought up in this discussion with Mikkel Hansen and I don't want to ruffle feathers, but <laughs> Mikkel Hansen clears Ivano Balic in every category for me. What comes to mind when I think of Mikkel Hansen is him floating around nine meters and just 
whipping a shot into the top corner. And just that is a, in a way that nobody else can do on as regular basis as him. He he kind of set uh, he, he set the trend in that regard for players being able to do that. And uh, that is something that has also like he's also redeveloped his career because that's the kind of thing that that sticks in our mind. But he was able to do everything at a given time. But and that is also something which I think somebody uh, commented on either on Twitter or on Instagram in response to your question about he is the the top whatever, but like how he's reinvented himself as well and, and stayed relevant up to the point of the final minutes of that Euro final where he was still very relevant to that game and the attack uh, is very remarkable. 36, now he has won everything internationally for the national team. He has gotten all of the individual awards, three-time IHF World Player of the Year, uh, three-time Handball Planet player of the year which is almost more important at this stage um mvps everywhere all-time top scorer in the olympics um also our left back also our playmaker champions league european championship world championship but he a couple of years ago moved to alborg and uh well this is this is his second season with alborg right second and last season with alborg uh, well i'm not mistaken yeah it is yes Believe it or not. Yeah, it's so strange. I really felt like he was there for longer. But of course, that Allborg team that made the final four was just before he arrived. Yeah. And so, because the news was out for longer that he was going to join the team. He signed a year in advance. And I remember when he signed that we had the discussion about his age and the more the age he was going to be when he finally joined them, which was 34, and whether he would still be able to have an impact for the team. And I think that's... That's probably the only area of this where there's going to be like a twofold disappointment. Number one, that he wasn't able to to have the impact on Alborg that everyone hoped he would. But massively, that he's going to end his career, perhaps, unless Alborg do the business this season, he could well finish his career without winning a Champions League title, which is absolutely bonkers. It is. And I was, I was looking through it and um you you have to think back to that psg team i think that's also part of his career so his his international career is definitely one of the greatest we've ever seen but on the club side it's a little bit strange you know he he starts off in denmark then gets the big move to barcelona and pretty much gets discarded a Mm. little bit early but also with um, AG Copenhagen coming through, he was an obvious signing for them and he, he left to join a seriously amb- ambitious project. So you wouldn't, it's not like he failed in Barcelona. I think he would have definitely continued and uh, gone to great lengths with that club. But AG Com- Copenhagen came up and it was this big, shiny, cool new thing, sleeveless, <laughs> handball jerseys, DJs in the stands, a handball match in Parkin Football Stadium, all of this rock and roll mm. handball early in his career. And uh, he really, you know, he enjoyed great success there. That that, that part of his career was fantastic. He, um, you know, won the Danish Championship a couple of times, reached the Final Four, um, still all early in his career. Um, and then comes the move to PSG after that comes crashing down, really only a three years of AG Copenhagen before comes crashing down and he spends 10 years in this PSG team. He was the OG PSG player. He was. He moved there before anyone else he did. Is, he's actually just travelled from one ambitious project to another. AG Copenhagen, then PSG kicked that off and then now in Alborg where um, he ends Real. his career. Um, and he spent these 10 years in PSG that, you know... He was a little bit hidden to the world while the, the French league was, you know, really at the at the top for many years. You could, you know, some of those years where he won the championship constantly were against very very impressive Montpellier and non teams as well. You can't disregard mm-hmm. that. And the closest he came um, with there's three um, Champions League third places so he has a whole bag full of bronze <laughs> medals but it, it was that um 
2016 final versus Vardar, the miracle of uh, 2017. Yeah, 2017, yeah. sorry, 2016, yeah. 17 season, where there was the miracle of Vardar, where they won in the final against PSG by just one goal, 24 23. Mikkel Hansen was incredible in the tournament. He was second top scorer in the overall competition. And that PSG team was just such a juggernaut. You know, Gensheimer, Karabatic mm. and Hansen. Amie in goals. And they still couldn't get it done. And it does leave a bit of a sour taste on the career, for sure. Um, that inability to, to grab that uh, Champions League win. But, you know, many players have, have faced that in, in their careers where... Um, just the randomness of the Champions League, the randomness of the Final Four has come to it. So I still, it, it's still an incredibly successful club career. Um, he, he's done almost it all. Uh, never played in the Bundesliga. Is uh, that, that was what I was going to ask there. Is like, is that another one that the fact that he he didn't go to the Bundesliga? I remember when when Sanders Augustin made the move to Kiel. I was like, now that's one. He's got one up on Hansen now in the the books uh little did i know then that uh norway would be such a disappointment for so many years to yeah, come that's you know that's it <laughs> and that is like that's something we'll look back on on the other side i mean like yeah unless if, you if he did go to the bundesliga do you think um his international career could have panned out exactly like it mm. did with the three world championships Maybe not. where you know he could have been beaten down destroyed and uh injured and unable to like take the full load of the danish team in, in that period and you know what if you ask them what would you trade the world championships or uh bundesliga hey he could have said both but um, i'm sure he'll he'll be happy with those gold medals when it comes to the fans who love him most which would be the danish fans what will live long in their memory will be what he's done for the national team that's that's what the legends of a of a given nation are remembered by. Um, it'll be the same for for Karabatic at uh, in France. The fact that he hasn't won a title with PSG, uh, hasn't won the Champions League title with PSG, won't be held against him. Um, you know, he's done it with Barca, he's done it with Montpellier, with Kiel. Yeah, I think it is the the Danish national team stuff that'll that'll stay with us. And I think that twenty nineteen World Championship was truly oh, yeah. one of the greatest championships from a player we've ever seen. Yeah. He was top scorer by far, 72 goals in the competition. He was the MVP and he, he just had his first child and it's that whole kind of father bounce that uh, we have seen in sport <laughs> where it just, he looked like a completely different like being in that tournament the the control the the way he just completely controlled every game from goals to assist to the tempo to just dominating fully and that danish team it was their first world championship as well now they're they're spoiled with three but it meant so much for that danish yeah. team and he he absolutely put them on their back and Took it home. You look at the final weekend there, you know, they smacked France by eight goals. He scored 12. They smacked Norway by nine goals. He top scored with seven in that game. Uh, 19 goals in the final weekend. And yeah, I just remember we were absolutely creaming ourselves yeah. when talking about Mikkel Hansen and that tournament in 2019. It was, it was his very best. Um, and yeah, uh, whether, whether a player has has dominated a world championship like that in yeah may it'll be the next time we see it will probably be uh when henny reistad does it <laughs> at some point which he's probably come close enough to it at that point but yeah i don't i don't see a, a male player doing that uh being so single-handedly better than everyone else and driving a team to to glory so we're, are we forgiving him for not winning the Champions League and not going to the Bundesliga then? I, I, Is that I, what I'm getting out I, of this? I fully forgive him for, for all of that. Yeah. I, I think, um, for me personally as well, I, I you know, I caught the Karabatic era 
uh, a little bit, but I, I didn't see him in his keel days to his full extent. Um, where he was that just um, dominant player. I've seen kind of the more mature Karabatic. I've seen bits of Ivana Balic um, and just clips of the former legends like, you know, Talon Dushabayev, Jackson Richardson and and the others. So for me, Mikkel Hansen is the greatest player I've ever watched fully. And I've watched his full career unfold um, and kind of been through the peaks with him. So for me, he really just excites me um, like, like no other player. And I don't think you can argue as uh, for Mikkel Hansen to be above Karabatic in the standings just because Karabatic is... He's like the Michael Jordan where like yeah. you can argue for in any sort of way and Karabatic has the the answer. He has the titles. He has the goals. He has the defense. He has everything. Um so it's it's unlikely that we'll ever see a kind of a resume stack up to Karabatic's. But that doesn't mean that what Mikkel Hansen has done is not just otherworldly and just yeah. beautiful. His whole handball style is just so unique, so graceful that um yeah, it's been joy to watch. And we, we will still get a little bit more. Um we have yes. The rest of the season, Allborg are still in the chase. Imagine, you know, imagine Mikkel Hansen um, coming away with a Champions League title and then an Olympic gold, taking down Karabatic in a final in their last ever games. Now that that would be, <laughs> you know, that would rival Messi's uh, yeah. World Cup win and yeah. sail to the sunset. And that's it. Allborg waiting for Vesprem in the quarterfinals. Um. PSG, in order to get to that, will have to beat, beat Barca, which uh, not impossible, not impossible, but uh, will be tough. Uh, and yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to know with the with the Alborg team. I I don't, I I haven't seen enough to convince me that they'll do it over two legs. They've shown, you know, everything, every level from fantastic to disastrous at different points this season um it'll be a good battle with fez brem and maybe the fact that he has announced his retirement at this point will be will be a real boost for this alborg team it'll be you know we're doing it for him uh we're doing it for miguel that'll i'll give them something a bit extra on the other side um just a word on karabatic we still haven't yeah. done Karabatic's eulogy, um, which we will do. I think it, that deserves a whole episode in itself. Uh, probably, uh, probably after the Olympics itself. Maybe <laughs> after the Olympics. So we'll see. Um, but uh, there was also that news that PSG are going to have a farewell party for him. Um, the, the, um, the game is going to be played in the, the final game of the season, I think, will be played in the Accord arena in um, Paris in front of 15,000 people to be his kind of true swan song to at least the club game uh, and the club yeah. which he definitely deserves and makes me think why don't PSG do that more often and not play more games in, in the bigger arena in, instead of their uh, shitty half-sized hall yeah but, uh, particularly for like you know a quarter final against barcelona i mean uh, you <laughs> could, you, could you ask could you ask for a better occasion like what well, the the Par- parisian fans would be all over it um and it's a great arena uh i was there for the uh the women's euro in 2018 and the atmosphere was absolutely electric it was fantastic um so yeah that would have been a great opportunity but uh yeah, not to be, but they uh, will get to probably celebrate the the French league title there, and uh, yeah, a nice a nice farewell uh, on the club side for for him if they don't get to to Cologne. Um, it's just going to be such a big farewell party these Olympic games. Like there's I know, so many the, players. Well, there's also uh, <laughs> Joan Kadeas has yeah, retired, retired as well. I don't know if that's with immediate effect. Even if it is with immediate effect, he's definitely going to be dragged out for the Olympics. I mean, <laughs> making that squad. <laughs> there's only one way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Nerea Pena as well uh, is retired. 
and that that after not being able to come back from from the plethora of injuries she's had. But you, you do feel like there's a lot of players out there who are just waiting for these these Olympics to be their last chance. Um, yeah, well, we, another one, we said that last Olympics and then Vera Mara well, playing yeah, for the Spain Spanish again. team. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's people with sense, you know. Um, <laughs> I think, and you know, for some some players, you know, I saw Diego Simone again today. Someone like him, it could be a good time to uh, to bow out with Argentina. Uh, the Croatians, like Courtney, asked me if I reckon Dovniak also, but. He's got a home world championship next January, so I reckon that'll be the yeah. that'll be the last one for him. But yeah, there there will be a few. But the fact that and uh, Stina Oftedal in the women's side going to be her farewell as well. So there's some real real goats yeah. saying goodbye in Paris, which is uh, yeah, it's going to be going to be emotional. It's the end of an era, I think so. And it really really leaves room for. The next generation to step into we haven't really seen it yet um especially like Mikkel Hansen and Karabatic are still the faces of handball um in a lot of ways you, you have you know they're the players who are right in front of the, the the media at world championships they're the most in demand and they will be gone and they're just we're just waiting for someone to really step in and take over that you know, face of handball mantle, and you know, hopefully that that new player, um, whether it's Matthias Gissel or Dikamem or whoever the space is left for, has a bit more charisma. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think Dikamem and uh, I mean like Remily Remily uh, Mem and Gissel have already more charisma than than what. Karabadic and and Hansen have shown, like Gietzel, I think is really uh, in January really is beginning to show that he 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 knows that he has to start playing the game and he's very good with media, and yeah I think that like we we talked about the the Mem versus Gietzel tradition now tradition right? yeah. it's gonna be that's gonna be the next tradition and uh, that is that is a really fun one as well because there's something. Uh, there's something more, I don't know, quick and explosive in a different way about the players that are coming through now. The players are getting smaller in a way. Uh, players are getting faster. They're doing more funky things. Um, it, it's all trends, right? Things go in, in different ways. But there's definitely a new trend in the sport um, towards explosiveness and, uh, and, and trickery that uh, I think will, will be quite exciting to, to see. And will be good in terms of forming uh, new new stars in the sport because their personalities are coming out in the way they play as well. Now, that's quite exciting, but it is a big leaves a big vacuum to be filled, and it's not quite there yet. Yeah, and and it's up to like the the media to to be honest to actually start building that. You know, we we've yeah. started talking about the Gisel um, rivalry. But that's that's not a thing, you know. Every we should every championship <laughs> yeah. that should that's how it should start. Like <laughs> the comparison of these players, you know, they should be put in front of the cameras. They should be trash talking each other. All, all of this, you know, give them the opportunity to um, make an impact. And it, it it's something that handball is not great at. And it can be done really easily. I mean, the latest example of that, which is. Uh, kind of just you speaking about it reminds me that I have been kind of engrossed by it. The women's March Madness in basketball. Yeah. Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese, the two like outstanding players facing off in the quarterfinals, even not even in the the final four. Uh, but that was all over my social media to the point where I was like, all right, getting. Th- Turn it on the VPN. I have to do getting it. YouTube yeah. TV. I watch it. We're watching the, watching the Iowa Iowa versus LSU games. Never watched a women's basketball game in my life. But now I was like, oh yeah, this is actually yeah, I'm here for it. <laughs> so it can be done, and it can transcend like countries. And it is just like you just have to look to look to the ESPN socials and you and 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 the people like the the journalists and. And the fans, and it, it really, they jump on these things so well. 
and just push it until you just accept that it's there exactly and uh, that's yeah. that has to be done we'll start doing it let's let's see if anyone follows i'm i'm getting my uh, hot take twitter keys out i'm, I'm ready to start stirring get shit. those burner accounts <laughs> charged up <laughs> well as you said there's still a long way to to go uh this season for still a lot of opportunities for them to add a bit more glory both for club and country before the uh their their careers end we're talking on wednesday night late on wednesday night uh here in europe after uh, we had some proper knockout handball again between Zagreb and Montpellier. And uh, I have to say, these two teams really delivered. In a round where there's not much delivery, these teams really uh, they gave us what we needed. Does your knockout handball soul feel filled it had the like bare minimum hit one out of four games <laughs> that yeah. ended up with some drama and, and it was it had the drama um mm-hmm. you were at the game of course uh but you know zagreb didn't make it easy they you know got, coming into the second half they were they were up and looking dangerous but then montpellier uh kind of turned on the gas and and, and closed them out what um uh, you know, what drove that um, kind of final performance for Montpellier? Really good coaching. Uh, Patrice Canet in his last season with the club took a, took a brave time out early in the half. Like, you know, we, you could really feel that it was necessary. The atmosphere had gotten really dodgy. Even at halftime, they were, they were level, but they were not comfortable by any means. There was a lot of similarities from the first leg, you know, raising their ugly head from a Montpellier perspective. Um, most notably them missing their 100% shots like their counter-attack opportunities and Mate Mandic making some wonderful saves and yeah they were looking comfortable Zagreb looking confident and, and Montpellier fixed the defence they uh, they focus with uh, Conan and Monte just playing in defence and, and they're bringing Simone uh, into the, the backcourt and attack only with uh, Stash uh, Scuba and finally, I, I don't know if it was a, so much a tactical side of things or just like a psychological thing where they allowed themselves to, to, to be bulking in a way. They allowed themselves to go out and hit them hard over and over again. And quickly, uh, they got a couple of turnovers, got a couple of uh, easy goals, and they were stopping uh, Serna from shooting. And once Serna got a little bit nervous about shooting, Zagreb fell apart. Uh, Milos Kos got injured, uh, so they lost the other big shooter. Klaritsa seemed to have a, a, a damaged right hand from the first half. He didn't feel like shooting. Um, they went seven on six, Zagreb, which was a complete disaster because then it was like, oh, no, we now we definitely can't shoot. We have to win a penalty or they're going to score an empty goal. And it's like, this is the worst group. This is the worst team to force that upon because in the end, they, uh, I think, Besides the defense, it was the fact that Montpellier had Stash Scuba as their playmaker and Zagreb didn't have a definitive playmaker in the classic sense. Yeah, uh, and also this uh, Zagreb team is quite strong. A few really good players have come out, but one area that's not their strength is line players. And mm. uh, that's seven on six. There was a number of incidences where <laughs> it's just straight up drop ball no. uh, up the other side, yeah. uh, empty net goal, and it it, it kind of worked. But you know they just didn't have the the passers or the catchers no. to to make it work. <laughs> so <laughs> to the to the basic <laughs> fundamental things in handball, <laughs> Zagreb can shoot, they can save, they can hit, but passing and catching uh, not very not good. The best. Uh, uh, yeah, so it was. It took it took a while. It took a good hour and forty five minutes of handball for Montpellier to finally figure out what they needed to do, um, and yeah, they they had the better team over the the two legs, um, and and deserved to go through. I think Zagreb can't be too disappointed in the end uh, with it with the way that second leg went. They lost by six in the end, which is a little bit harsh. We got to see Zlatko Horvat going right back for a while, which is I was waiting for. But yeah, I think you know Zagreb can can bow out of this season's Champions League with their heads held high, um, and with with a decent future ahead of them uh, if they can can keep 
you know, Koss and uh, and Serna, Claritza, Mandic. Yeah, and, I think and, they're like they're, they're future of this team. Yeah, and they they extended the contracts for Mandic, uh, Claritza, and Koss, I believe, for for mm. a couple of years. So they are committed Big. to this team. It'll be interesting to see if they actually um, strengthen it further. Um, I haven't seen too many rumors going around if if any players are going to join them, um, but it, it could be an interesting few years for for the Zagreb team. The other game, um, Kielsa beating Geoge. Geoge really just lying down <laughs> in this tie <laughs> and, and letting the better team um, go through. But I think the one thing to point out is that Alex Dushibayev was tremendous uh, across both legs. Um, he has he had a very slow start to the season and it kind of combined with Kielsa's injury woes and just trouble um especially kind of that mm-hmm. mid section of the season uh Kielsa were bad Alex Dushibayev was bad and that's that's the way it usually works <laughs> if Alex yeah. is not firing neither are Kielsa but he's gradually made it in he's averaging um eight goals over the last four games in the Champions League, got a uh, sixteen in two games against Geo Gay, and that will be really promising for um, Kielsa, who, um, you know, looked like they they were going to struggle, um, but made it through with absolutely no problem. Um, their team is kind of back. Wolf is in. Karolek is back in. Um, Simon Sichko is still the the main player they're missing, but it's it's okay with um, Danny Dushabayev there filling in at left back. So it's all looking looking pretty good for um, Kielsa now. Tomasz Gimbala as well back, shoring up that defense. So um, they're ready to kind of to mount a challenge. Only issue is they're. Uh, Facing off against Magdeburg in the next round. <laughs> the best team in the world right now. Yeah, but what a what a quarterfinal. That's gonna be the uh repeat of the the final from last season. Um and yeah, I won't I won't count Kielsa out just yet. Kielsa have the first leg at home, and that could be big because Kielsa I, I just always think back to when they smacked PSG at home in that first like nine goals and they could always pull off something special uh with the first leg at home the other ties are pretty much set unless something insane happens <laughs> in, in the i guess we'll, we'll record we'll record again if that something <laughs> we will insane record happens. if something insane <laughs> happens but uh Vesh Bram likely um through as he said playing Alborg in the next round uh psg um will likely get the business done against Visa Plus setting, setting up a tasty tie against Barcelona so that is that is a quarter fi- final matchup for uh, mm. or like a, a set of matchups for the ages I have to say um, Kielsa Magdeburg Barca PSG Veshpren versus Alborg and even Kiel Montpellier I think Montpellier are definitely um, ready to make some impact in, in that game against Kiel so Really, really interesting, and we better fucking get some good knockout handball in the quarterfinal. Or I'm, I'm just giving up on this board. <laughs> if it's not, if it's not at least if it's not at least three out of four, then yeah, it'll it'll be pretty sad. But uh, I yeah, I find it hard to imagine that not being the case. Can we talk a little European League before we go? Because the boys from Sevahoff with their with their little. Uh, <laughs> little ultras <laughs> young teams and young players even younger players probably than the ultras yeah they beat Hanover Borgdorf by nine goals at home in the second leg and knocked them out which is properly remarkable like this this can't be this can't be underestimated a Sevahov team which in Europe over the last few years have been a, a kind of a fun team to watch but never really looked like doing much damage, had lost their best player over the summer in Elias Ellison Ashipagatu. 
and yet have somehow done even better in uh, in Europe this season and have booked a quarterfinal spot against Flensburg. Ah, it's great. All, all I can imagine is the the director of Save a Hoff just pulling his hair out, wishing for his players like, to no. stop being so good so they don't have to lose money again. <laughs> We're losing Going. another 20 grand. <laughs> <They're just> fucking <laughs> bastards. Little, little <laughs> bastards. Stop being so good at handball. <laughs> Put down the ball, Felix Muller. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah, the Muller brothers, Felix and, and Seaman, and their, their dad who tackled uh Faradan Melich in the <laughs> in the main round. Um yeah, they're they're gonna be they're probably leaving at the end of the season. Or yeah, almost definitely so leaving. Felix at the end Muller of the season. is signed for Alborg, so he's going there um, yeah. at the end of the season. I think Seam Muller's still around. And you know, the the big piece that they are going to lose is of course uh Mikkel Applegren, their coach. It really, you know, you have to look at this as a, another diamond of the crown of uh, Michael Appelgren that he's been able to achieve so much with this type of team such a young kind of um, a team that just shouldn't be in, in this stage of the competition when you look at the other teams in the quarterfinal you know they're playing Flensburg like if, if you imagine the budgets of these teams it's it's a whole different ball game there's uh, Demon, Dinamo Bucharesti who are trying to buy every player on the planet um, Nantes Fuchs of Berlin Sporting, Brian Nicolivan, and of course Skern, the the biggest small club in the world. But you know, maybe not. Maybe Saverhoff is the biggest small club in the world. Well, yeah, that's funny. In in uh, in Saverhoff, their advertisement in the arena is the biggest handball club in the world because they apparently have the most players from top to bottom. Uh, so they they take a different approach to it. A great stat I I saw from Rasmus on Rasmus Boysen on Twitter, and it, this really puts. Uh, their achievement in like a Swedish context into uh, perspective. Sevehoff are only the second Swedish team to beat a German club uh, in a knockout game, home and away, in European club competitions. The first was Redberg's lead, who, by the way, the legendary club have been relegated to the third league in Sweden uh, recently. They beat Lemgo in the semi-final of the Cup Winners' Cup in 2002-2003. So some uh, long-awaited success for the Swedish teams. And yeah, but Seged fans have been licking their lips. Mikkel Appelgren on his way. And uh, I'm sure over the course of time, some of those players also joining him. Oli Mitton uh, comes to mind. And yeah, it's that's going to be a different ball game. You know, he's had Elverum. He's done a great job with them. Sabahoff done a great job with them. And straight into the you know, the, probably one of the most underachieving teams in Europe from the last decade uh, in Seged. Uh, but yeah, they've got a good man. That quarterfinal lineup in the European League, you know, it many of these teams could be in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Um, Fuchs of Berlin, Nantes. What a game that is going to be. This is European League gold, you know. This is classic matches, uh, classic teams. And yeah, in another world, well, next season in the Champions League. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Is that that's the one that stands out for you, I guess? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the others, uh, you know, Sporting versus Ryan Eleven is interesting. Uh, Ryan Eleven did did the job against Nexa. You know, I kind of liked this Nexa team for a while, and then I looked at our squad, and they're kind of, you know. They're very similar to the old Visla Plotsk or the old Zagreb where they have a bunch of L lads, whereas Marco Bezek, top scorer yeah. for them in that second leg against Rheinick 11. But yeah, they they sell through, you know, sporting. We've talked about how great they are. Do you know Bucharesti also flex their muscles? Really going to be an interesting matchup, but it could be a yeah. top, top final four. And, you know, only two out of the eight teams are German, you know, we might only see one German team in the final four. It's three, three. Uh, Fuchs of Berlin are just the, I their know, own I know, I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Flensburg can't as Danish these days. But <laughs> three, but okay, maybe there'll be two. Um, in the, two in the final four. The final four. But you reckon? Yeah, it's not it's not as clear cut. Uh, I think. Yeah, all of them would be fun. That's for sure. Uh, like Dinamo Skjern, I think has the makings of a just wacky, wacky pair of legs. Um, 
both teams with their ups and downs. So quick one on Bjorn Bros Silkebor because they they lost to Dinamo um, Bucharesti, but I just realized that that is just the retirement home for Danish legends at the moment. Uh, <laughs> Lauga Schmidt uh, in there. He's not that old, actually, 32, but he's leading that team. Beside him, uh, Nikolai Uris uh, on, on right back uh, with his big beard. Uh, what, what's he? 37 years old. They brought in, you know, just to shore things up, Morten Olsen uh, at his grand age to, to join that team. Rene Toft Hansen on the line. The Schustrand in goal as well. Remember Schustrand, mm-hmm. former Kiel goalkeeper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a bunch of legends you know, put them you, together. And you know who's joining next season? Nikolai Lesa from <laughs> Porto and Anders Zachariasen from Gog. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Zacharyson and Martin Olsen are just... It's like the Masters mates. team, you it know? It is the Masters Proper, team. Proper, like, Masters team. Just, today. you know, in some leagues, they, they go for, you know, an under-20 national team uh, playing in the National League uh, for whatever reason, like, to help development. Whereas in Denmark, they're working on having a world-class Masters team <laughs> for the over-35s next year, <laughs> letting them play in the top league. <laughs> I think that'll do it then uh, for this podcast. And... Uh, We'll have a morning club coming out shortly as well, where we'll look at the MVP race for the Champions League. That's always a fun little discussion. But until then, from Alex and myself, it's goodbye.